Did Alabama take Mike Shula for granted? A lot of fans consider the Mike Shula years at Alabama a dark time in the program's storied history. Winning was not an afterthought. Playing in a bowl game wasn't guaranteed. Alabama football was mediocre. He lasted four seasons in Tuscaloosa. He finished his head coaching career with 26 wins and 23 losses, a far cry from Bear Bryant and his replacement, Nick Saban, who has won six national championships at Alabama since replacing Shula in 2007. So you can imagine how being a fan and a student during the Shula era might compare to now, when Alabama is the gold standard in college football, when anything less than winning a national championship is an outright failure. So what was it like being a fan of Alabama during the Shula years? I think it was this kind of pervasive sense of nihilism that we weren't getting the same kind of experience that, you know, our fathers had gotten with Bryant and, you know, everybody else. But it was a sense of, okay, we're going to go to a game, we're going to have just an experience. It might not be a great one, and you might gut out like a five-point win unless you were playing some kind of paycheck game. Uh, and even those didn't always work out. As a student, it was just not a big deal. We, every game we thought, oh, this is a loss, you know, unless it was a, a small powder puff school, we, we thought it was a loss. So there wasn't a lot of confidence. Students now, even, even had a bad season. Uh, so it's definitely, uh, we went from the, the bottoms of lows to now it's like, oh, we got 10 wins, that's bad. You know, you, you had your moments, like you, you picked out your own fun. Uh, I remember the, the windshield wiper score for more uh, promotion. Like it was a big thing when we could get 28 points and you'd get that free windshield wiper fluid. And Rammer Jammer was such a big deal because holy crap, Alabama won. Let's, let's be excited about this one thing. I think most people at this point would probably say, you don't know how good you have it. Because back in the Mike Shula era, winning was precious. Now it's expected. It's a, a totally different sort of experience um, comparing today to uh, the Shula era. I certainly don't look back at that era in a negative light, and I don't look at Mike Shula in a negative light. I think based on the circumstances and everything that was happening before he got here and while he was in Tuscaloosa, things went fairly well, relatively well, especially compared to how it could have gone. In 2003, the program had just been hammered by NCAA sanctions, then lost Dennis Francione to Texas A&M, and then fired Mike Price due to his off-field actions in a PR fiasco. I was there at the Bryan Conference Center when they fired Price because it was like less than a mile from where I was staying, and it was on a Saturday before exam week, so I was like, why not? Let's go down and watch a coach get fired, which was still the most surreal thing I've ever seen. Everyone was really depressed, of course, because, I mean, it was May. The coach wasn't going to be able to work with the team until August. You know, they really wanted to hire somebody to obviously come clean up the image and somebody who would, you know, you can't really just find a good head coaching candidate in May of 20, or, or May of any year. So, you know, the candidates were a young Mike Shula who may have been 39 or so at the time. Sylvester Croom, of course, at that time, the SEC never had had a black head coach. And then Richard Williamson, who was a, a veteran coach uh, in college and in the NFL. Of the three candidates, I think everyone was more excited about Shula just because of the last name. He was the quarterback. Look at Mike Shula. Shula was starting quarterback at Alabama from 1984 to 1986. Touchdown! With two bowl victories and big wins over USC, Ohio State, and Notre Dame. His dad was NFL coaching legend Don Shula. He was a winner. There was people trying to get some bit of optimism out of it. I grew up a Dolphins fan, so I was I was definitely hoping for him. I think it was just the fact that here was this guy that people had heard of. I forget the fact he had never been a head coach. I don't even think he had coached in college since he left. He had been a pro football offensive coordinator. Even your 20-year-old Crimson Tide fans had heard the name, you know, even if it was synonymous with his dad. From what I remember, it seems like there was a pretty fair amount of excitement. And now on to the world of college football in Tuscaloosa, where the football world has been turned upside down this week and where Alabama today introduced its third college football coach in the last six months. Mike Shula, son of the great Don, longtime NFL assistant and a former Alabama quarterback himself from the mid 80s. So you might say that Shula getting the job was all because of destiny. But then again, 
it is funny, you know, 20 years to look back on what Alabama was going through at the time. And he was, I think in a lot of people's eyes, sort of a savior at the time and got people excited about Alabama football again. When Shula was hired as head coach in May 2003, he was only 38 and had a six-year, $5.4 million contract. Compare that to Nick Saban's eight years and $32 million of guaranteed money when he was hired to replace Shula in 2007. I can't say enough about uh, how I feel and how excited I am. I think he was sort of an embodiment of where the Alabama fan base felt like they were at the time, which is just, there's let's just have a clean start, no history, no record. Let's hit the reset button on the whole program. You know, you've got to walk before you can run. You gotta crawl before you can walk. And I think we were just in that beginning, rebuilding stage of, of the program. Mike Shuler recruited Hoover High School standout, John Parker Wilson, who would start all 12 games his sophomore season under the coach. It was very easy to lose sight of where we were. We were on probation. We were very limited in scholarships. Couldn't recruit guys, really, because we couldn't even go to a bowl game. We were kind of finding an identity as a program. And he definitely was on the forefront of turning that around. I guess the highlight was that 2005 year, you know, we, we beat Florida here at home and that was huge because that definitely wasn't supposed to happen. There was a huge amount of hype going into that game. Alabama was, was ranked, but, um, you know, kind of in that middle area. And Florida was a very heavily hyped team with Urban Meyer, all of this excitement around what they were doing. And Alabama just blew the doors off them from the beginning of the game. And it was, at the time, anybody who was there, if you ask them about that game, they'll tell you it was, it's the loudest they'd ever heard that stadium get. We scored on the first play from scrimmage to Tyrone Prothrow on a long pass, and it still to this day was the loudest I ever heard Brian Denny Stadium. Wants to go deep, but Prothrow is down there. He's got it, and he is gone. No flags. It was an absolute roar, and I think there was an itch to get back to prominence at that point. And I think when you saw a program like Florida who had hired this guy and kind of built in the right direction, all this talent that, that Florida had had and what they had become for us to make the first strike and then never let off. There was just so much tension built up from Alabama being bad for so long. They kind of couldn't believe that Alabama was good enough to do that to anybody, let alone a team that was supposed to be pretty good in Florida. So it was a huge deal at the time. There was never any more excitement around the program than at that moment. Celebration in Tuscaloosa will go on long into the night. Boy, at one point we climbed to, I guess it would have been 9-0 going to the game against LSU. I remember LSU coming to town and how hyped they were. And college game day was in town. And I had not experienced that. And it was just this okay, this is why you play college football. I signed here under Mike Shula, he's building something, everything's great, it's this big top 10 matchup, and I think we lost in overtime or right at the end of the game. Here's Russell, nobody open, fires it in the end zone, caught, touchdown, LSU has won! But you still had that feeling after the Florida game, throughout the LSU game, hey, we're building something. I remember thinking to myself, okay, if you just, just finish well, then all is well and you, you build that momentum going into the next year. The low point would have to be in 2006 because there was still some hope. Honestly, that whole year is, it's a blur. It's funny to think back on it because I sandwich it between great 2005 and Coach Saban's arrival. And all you remember is just kind of the wheels falling off. The program felt like it had leveled out under him. Even after 2005, it regressed and it didn't feel like it was going to get back to that point or even better after 2005. I think once he went 0-4 against Auburn and nobody had done that before, I think that's when Mal Moore knew he had to make a change. I mean, that Auburn team was very mediocre. They were beatable and Alabama just couldn't, you know, they, they clearly weren't getting any closer to catching up with Auburn. And you felt pretty sure coming out of that game that, that he was probably done. After leaving Alabama, Mike Shula went back to the NFL where he found success as an offensive coordinator for the Carolina Panthers molding former Auburn quarterback Cam Newton into league MVP. He has since been offensive coordinator of the New York Giants, quarterback's coach for the Denver Broncos, and is currently senior offensive assistant coach for the Buffalo Bills. In his time with the Bills, Buffalo's offense has been one of the best in the NFL, and its quarterback, Josh Allen, 
widely considered one of the best quarterbacks and players in the league. So did Alabama fans take Mike Shula for granted? Was he better than everyone remembers? Was he what Alabama needed in such a dark time? From Franchione leaving to Coach Price and the mess that happened there, he took the job in a tough situation after spring ball. And he did that because he was an Alabama guy himself. I think that's very easy to forget too. He's one of us. I think most people feel like Mike Shula was kind of a caretaker for this program for that stretch of four years that he was there. You had to have a guy who was loyal to the program, who needed to get his start in coaching, and who was gonna do things the right way and have a sort of clean reputation. You know, it's not a job that anybody would have done. You kind of need somebody special who would come in and know the challenges he was getting. And I think Mike Shula knew that. He just couldn't really get them over the hump. I think his legacy would be easier to talk about, easier to sort of parody if he wasn't a nice guy. If we could have just kicked him out of town because he was a jerk uh, or because he had his own, you know, Pensacola, uh, it would be different. But the way I look at him is he was dealing with an impossible situation suffers through a couple of bad years, has that one golden year, and then you know he gets kicked to the curb after that. But it's, I think, the legacy of a nice guy doing an impossible job under impossible circumstances, and it, it reached its eventual conclusion. Mike Shula, to me, rescued that program. Now, he didn't have the success in the end, but he took that job when nobody else wanted it. That's who Mike Shula was, and he loved the university, and he loved us players. And so I hope that in the end he's able to be celebrated as that guy that was the calm during the storm. They weren't Alabama's best years, but for those of us who went to UA between 2003 and 2007, they were our years. And we obviously won't forget them or Mike Shula. The insane success of the Saban era makes the lack of it prior to his arrival go down a little smoother. For many, there are no hard feelings. Winning cures everything. But go back to that 2005 season, when all the pieces came together despite so many obstacles. Alabama won nine straight games to start the season, and there was hope for a return to that glory. Then Jamarcus Russell hit Dwayne Bowe in overtime and LSU won. Then honk if you sack Brody and Auburn. Never mind. Visit alabamacu.com today and feel good about your money.